So picture this, eight-year-old Viola Davis in Central Falls, Rhode Island. Every day she would run home because the boys at school would chase her and call her every name they could think of. Fast forward two years later and Viola writes, at the age of 28, I woke up to the burning fact that my journey and everything I was doing with my life was about healing that eight-year-old, that little third grader Viola, who I always felt was left defeated, lying prostrate on the ground. I wanted to go back and scream to the eight-year-old me, stop running. I wanted to heal her damage, her isolation. That is, until a therapist a few years ago asked me, why are you trying to heal her? I think she was pretty tough. She survived. These are the words of my friend, Viola Davis, and this is her memoir, Finding Me. Welcome to all my Oprah's Book Club insiders and friends. As you all know, my latest Oprah's Book Club selection is Emmy, Tony, Oscar winner, Viola Davis's remarkable memoir. Her story powerfully chronicles how the tragedies that she endured and the triumphs she experienced ultimately led her to finding her voice in a world that didn't always want to see her. Please help me give a warm welcome to one of the strongest, most courageous women I know, mm -hmm. the Viola Davis. Oh, oh that's hello. such a nice introduction. Oh, I love so that. So Thank so you, Oprah. <laughs> also with us here, let me introduce you. Today are six of our Oprah's Book Club members. Maxine from California. Hello. Uh, Shannon from Nebraska. <laughs> Jamis from Maryland. Diamond from Georgia. Stacy from Louisiana. And Tamara from Montreal. Thank you all for reading with us. Reading with us. We love Thank it. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for having us. I know. I, I surprised you all the other day and said, all right, you're going to have a chance to meet Viola, but you got to read the book in three days. <laughs> Everybody, assignment completed, correct? Correct. Yes. correct. Oh, okay. Awesome. Okay, let's dive right into the deep here. So this is a book club. We have our little wine. Do you all have your wine there? Ooh. We have our little wine here. Oh, oh cheers. <laughs> cheers. We have a little rosé. Let's get to it. Cheers. So Maxine, we're going to start with you. Take a sip and go for it. You identified mm -hmm. a lot, you say, with Viola's story. You're the youngest girl, also number five. Tell us about your experience reading this book. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So, um, so yes, I am the fifth girl and followed by my beloved brother, who was my mother's golden child. Um, so I felt a lot like the forgotten child in all of that. Um, but I didn't realize until I read your book, Viola, that there was someone else who was as dark skinned as me and as unseen as me. All of my sisters are lighter skinned, almond eye shape, and my friends were mixed race and lighter skinned. So I really was that, that one at the end that never got anything. Um, so I guess my question for you is, in chapter 10, I read where you said, when you are a dark skinned girl, no one simply adores you. Mm. And I thought that that was so mm. honest and was also what I had come to believe because everybody passes over the dark skinned girl do. with big eyes and full lips. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how did you survive living in a world as a child where no one calls you pretty and you felt unseen? I actually love that passage so much, so yeah. thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. I think she ends that paragraph by saying that it's a form of erasure. It is. It's a form of erasure. Absolutely. And I think, here's the thing. At the end of the day, beauty is not a value. Once you embrace it as a value, you know so many women out there, you've heard the saying, she had so much going for her. She was so beautiful. It's like, what else did she have going for her other than her beauty? 
So what happens mm -hmm. when people don't acknowledge that is you develop other facets of yourself and you develop it early on. Your ability to, I don't know, make people laugh. Your ability to read the room. Your ability to, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, be empathetic. All these other values you develop. That's what happened to me. I had to develop so many things mm -hmm. that were outside of uh, beauty confirmations from people. So when other women, by the time they were 55, were just devastated that they could walk into a room and nobody acknowledged their beauty, I'm like, I got that covered. I discovered how to do that <laughs> when I was like 10 years old. And also, I had to tap into that erasure because I had to find out what was causing so much trauma and anxiety in me when I became, I don't know, an adult in my 20s. And I had to whittle it down to the cold, hard truth that it did affect me. It just did. It made me feel like I had to prove to people that even though I had all these other qualities, do you think that I'm pretty? Mm. Or yes. do you think that yes. matters? I had to acknowledge the role it played in my pain. But I will mm -hmm. say that the other train that was leaving the station is all, uh, all the things that I developed in myself to help me become the woman I am at 56. I developed those values. I really did. And I think that's what helped me find my husband. That's what's helped me find my joy. That's what helped me uh, to have the courage mm -hmm. to even write this book. That makes any sense. Yes. Yes. It absolutely does make sense when you, particularly when you talk about developing other characteristics. Like I can read a room. I'm content to walk into a room where I know nobody and be able to go and find somebody to talk to. But it was it was painful those those years of just being overlooked and forgotten and um you know trying to i used to try um and squint my eyes so they didn't look so big and i'd put yeah. lipstick on the inside so my lips didn't look too full so i might look like my sisters who were beautiful or my friend who was beautiful um but when i squinted i couldn't see where i was going so that that didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it never worked. I always go back to that saying in the color purple, Miss Seeley, I, 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 I may be black and I may be ugly, but I'm here. Mm. Yes. You know, yes. and yes. you show up. Yes. I have not read on anyone's tombstone that 50 million people found me to be very beautiful. And then the birth date and the death date. Nobody ever writes that on the yeah. tombstone. And you know, you have to figure out no. what you go write on your tombstone, you know. Right. I know that for a fact. Yes. And nobody ever thinks of writing that. <laughs> so that goes to show you its value and its importance in our life. Speaking of Color Purple, you used to always do auditions and you would do yep. some piece from the Color Purple. What would you do? Would you do that? No, I would do the first three pages. Dear God? Yep. Wow. That got me into a lot of institutions. That got me a lot of work. <laughs> yes. Wow. The first three pages of the book. Of the book. Mm -hmm. Wow. Please tell me what's happening to me. Yep. Wow. All right. Thank you so much for sharing, Maxine. Shannon from Nebraska, you said that this memoir forced you out of your comfort zone. What did you mean by that, Shannon? I appreciated this read so deeply because your openness and your honesty um, on a lot of really difficult, difficult topics. Um, Many I could connect to, like your um, conversations on healing and spirituality and, and how that has um, helped you um, and how you were able to keep hope, you know, while overcoming traumatic experiences. You said you were just ensnared by the trap of abuse, um, constantly beating, beaten down uh, by so much that you began to feel like you were wrong, not that you did wrong, but that you, you wrong. Um, so uh, even though you, you know you grew up in such an abusive environment and home, um, there were clearly things that you cherished about yeah. your childhood. And, yes. and uh, so I just thought maybe I, you could speak about what were the good parts of your childhood that you 
hope to pass on to your daughter? Oh my goodness, there's so many good parts. I mean, my father's humor, you know, and his humor that just had the ability to change the whole air in the room. You know, Julius, my husband reminds me a lot of that part of my father, just humor. The humor that we, that, that is very, very culturally specific too. That in the midst of all of our pain, you know, there's still room for laughter, um, which my father was very, very good at. Um, and also the good part of my mom still being a fighter. I mean, my mom would take her wig off. Literally, I saw her take her wig off, put my brother's shoes on to just confront this person who was coming up against my, my sister, Danielle. And she had her fist uh, balled up and she would fight, take her wig off, and I just loved that. I loved the fighter in her, just like I love the fighter in my, my, my daughter, and I try not to squelch it. I really do. I really try not to squelch it. Um, and all the times with my sisters, how we used our imagination, mm. how we would go in my parents' closet and take their clothes and their shoes and create different characters and play for hours upon hours and really believed that we were in that world that we created. And in that world, we could be anybody we wanted to be. And that's what saved us a lot of times. Um, you know, so, so much. I, it's, it's endless, you know, those, and those moments actually carry you through the trauma, those buoyant, those more right. moments of, of levity and, and buoyancy, they, they carry you through. Because if you oh. didn't have that, you really would fall apart. You would. Re really would fall apart. Yeah. So thank you, Shannon, I for that. I found that to be true for myself yeah. as well. Thank Absolutely. You. Jamise, you were drawn to Viola's relationship with her sisters. I, I, I was too. I think that <laughs> sister bond, bond, she calls them her platoon. <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, this is the best book club I've ever been to in my life. I'm going to say that up front. Okay. Um, Viola, okay. Cheers, I cheers. Cheers book. to you. Okay. I, cheers, cheers, cheers. Cheers, cheers, yes, cheers. Cheers to that. <laughs> Viola, I adored your book. And yes, Oprah, I was drawn to Viola's relationship with her sisters because I too have a close and loving relationship with my only sibling, my sister. But as we grow in life, we also create our chosen family. And I personally know that black women have been anchors throughout many pivotal moments in my life. And my chosen sister, sisterhood circle began when I was in college with a lot of my friends who are still a part of my life now. So Viola, I'm curious about what your sisterhood circle looks like outside of your biological sisters. How have these relationships <laughs> impacted your life and how do they fill your cup? That is a very, very good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have been challenged by <laughs> posses lately only because of my schedule, but I, the women in my life, one of the thing, one of the prerequisites is I love people who are transparent. I love people oh, who own yes. their story. I, I really have a hard mm -hmm. time with women who come into the room and somehow they've never had a bad day. They've never let anybody, yes. to, um, you know, get the best of them. Um, their kids are gifted students, they're all straight A's, they all do exactly what they're told. Um, usually they're not gonna be a part of my circle. Mm. I like the women who dig down deep. Those, my posse, the, 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 the brave warrior women who are also really, really funny and um, cause I like laughing and I don't like a lot of gossip. I'm not gonna lie about that. I, yeah. I'm one of those women, I don't have a, I'm not really good at sitting around and like tearing other women apart and, and laughing about mm -hmm. it and looking at pictures of other women and say, why did she wear that? That is not my style. Yes. And I'm not saying that to make mm -hmm. myself look good. It's just not my style. I like the women who will get together, like I said, laugh, 
transparent. We share. We share our thoughts about life. We go upstairs maybe to my house or we go to a spa. We spray perfume. We do our little spa treatments while we're talking. <laughs> mm. You know, we eat a lot. Tell me this. You know? Did you have to... Uh, did you did you have to weed out some friends? Did you reach a point where you realize that people who the, uh, yeah, Michelle Obama calls it losing oxygen that people yes. couldn't hold the space? I have. Uh, that's happened that. to me, unfortunately, yeah. a lot. You know what I f I find the thing that tr has tripped me up a lot, I, and I'll be very transparent with this: when people say you don't want any friends around you who are not going to tell you the truth. Even though it's really hard, they tell you the absolute truth, even if it hurts. I've had a hard time with that one. I've gotten to the point where that statement right there has bitten me in the ass more than I would like to admit. Because what happens is it gives people the license to be mean to you. Mm. You know, mm, under absolutely. the headline that I'm just being a friend. I'm just being honest. And after a while, it's like, Okay, but why is it that Why are I don't you bringing like me it? that? Exactly. You and know it's what? Not said in love. I thought that when I was reading uh, in Finding Me about the friend mm -hmm. who came to you after it was announced that you were going to be playing mm -hmm. Annalise on How to Get Away with Murder, and that friend, did you all think that? The friend yes. said, Oh, yes. yeah, you know, lots of other people are saying that you shouldn't yeah. probably have this role. Oh, yes. You know, not me, but other people are saying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's like Mark Twain says, you need two friends, you know. Uh, what is it? The, 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 <laughs> the friend that spell, uh, spreads the rumors about you or the friend who delivers you the news about other people who are spreading the rumors right, about you. Right, right. But I, regardless, I mean, I don't want to be catty or whatever, but my group of friends are people that I feel safe with, that create a sacred space where you can literally be yourself in a way that is... Um, even scary, but they're there to love you and to have really great laughs, you know. People will have your back, People like my you. sisters do. Well, yes, I would say that mm -hmm. once you've grown up with your sisters the way you all grew up, that mm -hmm. nobody can penetrate that. No. Yeah, no. you all are your own platoon. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Jamise. The age of uh, 28 was a turning point in your life story, Diamond. And it was for you as well. This is the fastest I've ever read a book. I mean, it read like a movie. It was so good. And I feel like when I turned 28, I started therapy because all of my trauma was getting in the way of my purpose. I started to heal from my eating disorder. And so I was really struck by the clarity that you received at 28 because I felt the same way. And I know that you mentioned, you know, that you realized it was all about healing the eight-year-old girl. So I was wondering, like, what did that healing look like and what was the catalyst for you to go on that journey? The catalyst was just like yours. I, I just felt like I couldn't start my life. I kept having the same horrible boyfriends. I kept feeling exactly the same way I always felt and I just got tired of it. You know what I realized in my 20s? <laughs> that I never really had a good night's sleep. I was always wondering why I fell asleep during class because I never slept. I'm afraid of the dark. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the horrific things ever happened. My child happened in the middle of the night. I got tired of it. I really did. I got to the end of my rope and I came to the, the, to the conclusion that literally it's on me. And then it catapulted me into therapy <laughs> when I got enough money through Screen Actors Guild to afford it. <laughs> <laughs> then it catapulted me into therapy and it catapulted me into the biggest power tool I have, which is me. I never ever knew that. That was like learning how to speak a whole new language. I didn't even know what therapist was talking about when I first sat down. I just said, okay, can we start? Let me tell you what's wrong, and then uh, you can fix it mm -hmm. <laughs> in 10 sessions, because that's all I could pay for. <laughs> when she started the whole process, I was like, oh my God, this is a lifelong journey? I mean, you need to give me my money back. But um, 
I, and I think 28 is probably the good age because that's the age where most of us get out of school, whether it's, well, undergraduate or graduate degree, you start your life, right? And um, right. that's what catapulted me. And all of a sudden, I, become, I became woke. Slowly but surely. I love that. Thank I, you so much. I think 28 for a lot of women is an age of awakening. It I felt is. that too for myself. Stacy from Louisiana, what stood out to you, Stace? Hi. Hi. Um, Viola, I could not put this book down. It was very inspiring to me. So I'm just, I feel so honored to, to have this opportunity to speak with you about it. Um, towards the end of the book, in one of the last chapters, you talked about the importance of choosing yourself. Um, and that really resonated with me as someone who has recently recognized the value that comes from that. Um, you also talked about the challenge of fulfilling your needs while at the same time sacrificing and juggling the huge task of, you know, binding your family together. My question for you is what advice would you give to women who are trying to put themselves first and meet their own needs within the constraints of a younger family? Hmm. That's a hard one. First of all, if you don't have you, 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 you can't be a source of any kind of strength or help for your family. You just can't be. Mm -hmm. Listen, I feel like I've gone through days where I've woken up and I've never thought about myself. I just get on the track of getting work done, get it done, go to bed, wake up, start it all over again. If I have any receptors that go off during the course of the day of pain or anxiety or not liking this person or feeling like this person is, 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 is looking down on me or whatever, I just sucked it up, kept going and going and going until it has a buildup. That anxiety builds up into depression it really does. And now I realize, I I'm not, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I know I'm gonna use a really sort of strange analogy, but it's the only one I could think of at the moment. I don't consider myself to be the best driver in the world, but I was just driving in, New uh, in LA the other day, driving, 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 and I realized, Viola, you're driving really good. You don't have anxiety, you're just you're driving defensively or whatever. And you know why? Because lately I woke up to the fact that I was gonna have clear cut boundaries. I don't get with everyone. So every phone call I'm making, every Zoom call, I open my mouth immediately and I say, no, I'm not gonna do A, B, or C. If you want A, B, and C, this is how you, gotta, you have to approach me. I no longer am gonna respond to this, bop, 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 that. I have had pushback, I've pushed back, and then, wow. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. it's beginning this mm -hmm. strange, yeah. this, mm -hmm. this alchemy. That strange alchemy, that, that literally the power of no and creating boundaries and creating a sacred space for yourself to be proud of you, to put you, it's like Glennon Doyle says, perfect. I've been reciting it. When it comes down to disappointing other people or disappointing yourself, choose other people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been <laughs> I've been a proponent of that Absolutely. and it has listen I've been sleeping better I laugh more with my husband unless I, I can't laugh anymore with my husband we go to bed laughing we wake <laughs> up laughing I'm laughing more with him I'm laughing more with my my daughter all of a sudden this different spirit of Viola has been released Was writing the book a part of that also Absolutely and every single time, I'm telling you, little Viola shows up. And little Viola, the number one thing little Viola is reminding me of is to have fun. Just fun. Mm. Even that, Genesis told me that one day, my 11-year-old. She was nine at the time. She said, Mommy, I don't want to be deep today. I just want to <laughs> laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear her saying that. Oh my goodness. But I anyway. can hear her saying that. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tamara, May, you said that reading this book gave you an appreciation of the cards you'd been dealt. Tell me more about that, Tamara. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you both for the light and the gifts that you share with the world. Um, being here is quite the honor. Um, and Viola, it's actually some of the dark side that was in your book that resonated with me. Um, I too was bullied as a child and suffered a lot of emotional abuse in the home. Um, and I've gone through life with the attitude that I'm going to make something of myself despite what I went through. But what I took from your book is that you achieved all your success because of what you went through. And that really marked me. It was a real turning point for me to change my perspective and have more appreciation for the path and the cards that I, that I was dealt. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, the chapter that resonated with me the most was chapter 11, being seen. Um, you open with a quote that says, may you live long enough to know why you were born. Mm. So my question to you is, do you feel that at this point in your life, you've lived enough and reached a point where you know your why? Yes, I do. And you know what? I think it was always there. But then Genesis came along. And, you know, there's something about being an older parent because the only thing, I'm um, just being honest, what's in your mind is you're going to go before them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what are you leaving? Yeah. What are yeah, you leaving? Oh. It's, you know, I, I continue to say this, that life, it's like running a relay race where you get the four, four of the best runners, like the greatest runners, and your job is to run your leg of the race and pass that baton with as much strength and force to the next runner mm -hmm. and hope that they run their leg of the race and then they pass the baton. And that's what life is about. It's like running your leg of the race and passing a baton to the next great runner, which for me is my genesis. And the power that she's gonna have is the power of my stories. I don't want to be a secret to her because I see, let me tell you something. For me, it's just my opinion. The, the people who are on the weakest foundation are the people who spend a huge amount of time covering up their stories. And then anybody could come and topple you over by by revealing it. Oh. <laughs> my strength and my warrior fuel is you can't tell me nothing about my life. I'm not ashamed of nothing. What do you have for me? And I want Genesis to feel that way. That every little imperfection and perfection and beauty and positive, negative traits she has is specifically designed for you to use as fuel as you go through your life. Because what else do we have when we're going through anything? I mean, you could go to therapy, but what else do people give you? Seriously, they could tell you how to go to school, how to make straight A's, even maybe know how to save some money. But who tells you how to move through trauma and disappointment? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody gives you permission Nobody. a lot of times. And social media certainly doesn't help you. So. I always say there's no U-Haul in the back of a hearst. <laughs> I say that to G, my genesis all the time, is your power is everything you have inside of you, sweetheart. Your head and your heart. That's powerful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This has been a wonderful gathering, but before we go, I want to give the final word to our author. I've asked Viola to read. We all have our favorite passages, so... Uh, I want you to read your favorite passage as a closeout okay, to us. Read okay, you, yeah. okay, the floor is yours. Okay. The call to adventure signifies that destiny has summoned the hero. The hero, whether god or goddess, man or woman, the figure in a myth or the dreamer of a dream, discovers and assimilates his opposites, his own unsuccessful self, either by swallowing it or by being swallowed. I still see my younger self so clearly from that fateful day in my therapist's office. She stands up in tears on a mound of snow, pissed off 
she shouts, bitch, I'm not going to be swallowed. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Refuse to be swallowed. Wow. Thank you for telling the story. I don't know about you all, but I felt that this was one of, certainly one of the most powerful memoirs I've ever read. And I not only saw myself in Viola's story, but found that her vulnerability, her ability to tap into the finding the self-love for herself makes me want to reach deeper for my own. And I hope it's done the same for all of you who mm -hmm. have read and are reading this book. So yes. thank you to all of our book club members and for mm -hmm. all of you joining us here today. Uh, for more content like this, you can follow Oprah's Book Club and become an Oprah Daily Insider where you'll get access to and be able to participate in more exclusive conversations like this one. May not be with Viola, okay? But I hope you all keep reading and uh, I'll see you soon. Hi, everybody. Oh, oh my God! Oh, my God! <laughs> you six will be a part of the panel asking questions for Viola, which I know you're going to have so many things great to say. The book is unbelievable. Oh, my God.